everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Patrick. Uh, welcome to the Passion to Profession panel um, that we are excited to be a part of this morning. Um, I am excited to have a seat at this table and I'm looking forward to an interesting and uh, compelling conversation about artists and business people, entrepreneurs. So we're going to get started. Um, I asked if they wanted to introduce themselves and some said sure and somebody else said no way so I get to introduce them. <laughs> So we'll start just how my paper goes, no particular order. Cynthia Connolly is an American photographer, curator, letterpress printer, graphic designer, and artist. She graduated from the Corcoran College of Art and Design and worked for Discord Records and DC Space. In 1988, she published Band in DC, photos and anecdotes from the DC punk underground. Through her small press, Sundog, Cynthia currently works for Arlington County, Virginia as a curator. Carrie and Neil Stavely own the brick and mortar handmade gift shop, Tin Top Art and Homemade, which is just down the block, mm -hmm. which features their work as horse and hair and the work of many other independent US artists and crafters. Carrie is a graphic designer by day and photographer, painter, and conceptual musician by night. Neil is an to quote their website, unflinching tattoo artist, painter, and printer. He can be found most days at Body Art in Berryville, Virginia. Sarah Cohen, down at the end there, is a, quote, filmmaker turned chip artisan, according to Middleburg Life, oh. and president <laughs> of Route 11 Potato Chips in Mount Jackson, Virginia. Since 1992, Sarah has led Route 11 Potato Chips to take a piece of the, if I understood it correctly, $100 billion snack food industry. <laughs> Her 41 employees, which may be more at this point, turns about 6 million pounds of potatoes and 1 million pounds of organic sweet potatoes into handcrafted chips each year. Jill Donnelly Hugh is the owner and founder of Dharma Yoga Studio in Old Town, also just up the block. Jill is a creative yoga instructor, often working to quote her description, upside down and trying new approaches to poses. At her studio, she inspires many and aspires greatly. She is a devoted yogi, supporter of the arts, and aspiring guitarist. So my name is Christine Patrick and I own the Winchester Book Gallery, which is next door, the independent bookstore in Old Town Winchester. We were tasked with discussing the highs, occasional lows, and blessings of turning passions and obsessions into business plans. In a recent academic study, Harvard Business School professor Ryan Raffaelli looked at independent bookstores in the United States in an effort to understand how independent bookstores, quote, preserve legacy technologies and business models in established fields when faced with technological challenges or change. His findings, which are published, uh, attribute the resilience and resurgence of independent booksellers since 2009 to the three C's, community, curation, and convening. I think this idea of the three C's applies to our panel here, building community, curating inventory to a more personal and specialized customer experience and building spaces that establish the experiential nature of a gathering place. So that's sort of how I thought our conversation could go. Um, so does everyone want to say hello, and then we'll kind of get started? Uh, so I'm Neil Stavely, uh, pleased to be on this panel. First time I've ever done anything like this. Um, I specialize in woodcut printmaking, painting, commission art. Um, we do fine art as well as, like I said, commission, commercial kind of things. So we go a lot for a balance of um, you know, different ways to make a living as far as turning your creative work into um, um, you know, a money-making endeavor. We find it's best to hustle in many different ways. So one of the first projects we ever did in Winchester was actually for the book gallery um, when Andy Geyerson owned it. Um, he asked us to do, well, we'd already done some portraits of authors, so, um, so yeah, Andy just kind of brought us in and asked if we could do something, and um, 
if you go in there, you'll see them, they're all blown up. But um, that was kind of our first connection to the community. Um, Andy was doing some small art shows, and, um, and that was like 14, 15 years ago. 2011. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so community is definitely key to our business. And um, yeah. Hello, first off, thank you for having me here and allowing me to be heard. Um, small business owners, um, I guess you guys can all appreciate all the work and effort that goes behind having a brick and mortar. It is oftentimes, um, it's funny, I get asked all the time, so what else do you do? Which is, I mean, I, it, I, you saw me roll my eyes there. I mean, I really try to limit that. It, it consumes you. Uh, you're, if you have to be incredibly passionate about, passionate about what you are actually providing the community with. My studio is called Dharma, but what I was originally going to call it was Kula. And Kula is a Sanskrit word that means community. And I truly believe, like Andy said earlier, it's not my brick and mortar that makes it successful, it's the people that walk in the door. And I'm often that nudger, like Andy, to get people um, to be excited about realizing their potential. So for me, before all of this, I considered myself a very successful introvert. <laughs> and now I'm like kind of pushed into this public environment. But I feel like it's my dharma, it's what I'm meant to do, so that overrides the discomfort. Uh, that I am experiencing now, and sometimes when I'm doing my business, but it's it's all worth it because it builds community, and it, you know we're only as strong as our most weakest member. And I'd like to think that I'm a part of building a stronger community, as Carrie and Neil and everybody else here. So again, thanks for having me. I'm Cynthia Connolly. I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, moved to the D.C. area in 1981. When I was a child in Los Angeles, my favorite places were packed restaurants, a huge coffee shop, a 24-hour coffee shop, and this restaurant. And my, I realized years later that my attraction was the community building, even in a restaurant, um, and the sort of the excitement of that, um, the intellectualism of who we are as humans, that who we, we have this intellectual capacity. And I've realized all these years that that was what I was attracted to. Uh, so um, as a child and growing up and then moving to Washington, D.C., I was involved in the Los Angeles punk music scene, which was an extremely um, exciting uh, music scene in the late 70s and early 80s. And I moved to D.C. and immediately got involved in the D.C. area punk music scene. And um, from there, I explored communities all over the place, and I still just gravitate towards people, even places that don't have any connection and finding that connection. So um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about community. Uh, it's a very important aspect of who we are to always generate community. And the thing I do now for Arlington County is I'm special projects curator and I curate something that I uh, came up with called the Arlington Art Truck where I uh, <laughs> curate specific art projects or drive to where people convene uh, based off my uh, experience of working at a farmer's market for 20 years where there's community, uh, which I never connected. And so we go to farmer's markets and festivals and we unload projects and there we start our own communities by uh, starting a dialogue with the artist and the art. Um, and I think I'll probably do this until uh, the last moments of my life is that interest of pushing out into spaces and starting dialogue. So, thank you. I'm, I'm Sarah Cohen, and um, I grew up in DC and moved out here. Actually, I've been making potato chips for 27 years now, which is hard to believe. Um, but I, I moved out here knowing, you know, I was going to start a potato chip company, didn't know what it was going to be called. And, um, but I knew that I couldn't do this in DC. I knew that it was gonna take a special place, a special location, and I was familiar with the Shenandoah Valley, um, but I did not know, know a soul out here. <laughs> so when I moved, it was a little bit shocking, and I, I actually went to bingo at the Middletown Fire Hall a lot as entertainment, <laughs> and stared at the walls, and, and I'm an introvert also, so it, just put in a weird position to try and start something up, but I think it was, it was good for the business. But I had a moment out here where I realized everything was gonna be okay, and it's a bookstore-related moment. I was walking on the mall, and I saw a sign 
that said Satisfied Mind. And it was Lauren Bear's bookstore slash espresso shop. And it was like a beacon of light. And I thought, oh, I can do this. I can, I can, I can be here. And since I've been here, um, I moved out here in 1991. Um, this community has just has grown up and is just kind of, I don't know, just bloomed in ways that I didn't think possible. So I'm honored to be here today with these guys. So I think it's a great connection to talk about the Satisfied Minds, which was a, a, a precursor to kind of where Winchester is today. And I think that's a lot of um, what everyone talked about, what we build this community. So one of my favorite things about being a bookseller is I get to have conversations about everything, from tech, how do I fix this, to, I don't know, the drought in some sub-Saharan country, to poetry, and I'm supposed to know it all perfectly. But what we love is I get to learn from everybody who asks me about that. And I think I'd love to hear you all talk about when you meet someone who is curious and interested in what it is you can do to sort of satisfy their interest, but also their vision, um, how that creative process really drives the businesses we run. So um, I'm gonna start with you, Carrie. Okay. Um, so with Horse and hair, as I said, you know, we do a lot of portraits, and I know and we do craft shows. Um, one of the things that kind of delights me when um, we're out selling our stuff um, is when, yeah, like a young person might ask who a picture is of, and so we get to educate them on who they, who they are, what they write about, um, uh, and then with Tin Top, it's kind of the same thing. There isn't really anything like my shop around here. Um, there aren't that many galleries. So um, I really just wanted to bring in a lot of, you know, different artwork that, you know, people don't normally see around here. So um, again, it's, I kind of like getting, you know, the reaction of uh, the people that come in and, and having that dialogue with them about it, so. I keep going that way. So the question is how to satisfy a curious customer? Yeah, okay. you get them. I just want to make sure. Yeah. I do. I would say I have a very, I have a unique business in the fact that no one walks out with anything tangible. Uh, that being said, it's something, you know, one of my biggest kind of pet peeves is now if they walked into Carrie's store and, and took something for $15, they could get in trouble legally. Now if someone comes to my studio and doesn't pay for a class, that's okay. Right, it's kind of one of those things. So my service, the service part of it, when people walk in and they're curious, they're already looking for something. They want something. And usually when you walk into a yoga studio, you're wanting to feel better. Either you want uh, physical relief or you want mental relief, spiritual relief. There's some sort of relief that you're looking for me to satiate or to fill or to help you with. And that's fine, because I love curious people. I'm a curious person. Most creative people are. You have to be curious in order to kind of scratch the surface. Um, I deal with mostly objection. I, what's interesting for me is people will walk in, which means that they're interested, and they'll immediately tell me why they can't stay. <laughs> they don't have enough money, no time, uh, they're not flexible enough, but they'll be back when they are. That's what they tell me a lot of times. So I have to actually work through objection to get someone in the door. So it's a very different kind of marketing approach from my level. So I usually sit and I listen to them and by the end of it, I know that that's Tim and I know that Tim is needing this. And if I can create an intimate connection with someone, which I do, I don't know how to not do that, um, they end up being a student. But it's, it's that I, I deal with objections first and then I, not that I'm doing this in my mind, reeling them in, I'm creating a good, very intimate and authentic connection um, that gets them in the door. So I guess it's conversation and connection and intimacy, really that brings them into a group class. I don't know if that answered it, but sure. I'm passing it on. <laughs> don't ever walk out of a yoga class without paying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were so overwhelmed by the yoga they forgot. <laughs> wow, I just changed my life. <laughs> I feel like I walk out in a daze. You know, I wear so many different hats, and so I don't 
since I have a full-time job as a curator for Arlington County, I never really have to worry, worry, worry quote unquote, about uh, making ends meet by selling my artwork. And that was intended. Um, I didn't want to create products that um, supported myself. So although what ended up happening was I did create products that support myself <laughs> and give me a really nice extra stream of income. And um, so the different dialogues I encounter, I have different hats. There's a, one is a special project curator for Arlington County and then the artist. But what's interesting, what you're talking about is this moment um, of engagement that I was sort of mentioning is for me, it's all about discovery. So if, we, if you meet somebody and they have a question, whatever that might be, um, it's the conversation and discovering something about each other, but then the excitement of where that discussion goes. Um, so for example, at the Arlington Art Trust, there's a lot of people who walk by who will not engage with the artwork. It can be interactive, it can be what you sort of would imagine it would be, like coloring something in, or it could be, for example, right now we have a sculpture by an artist from Baltimore, Baltimore. his name is Neil Feather, and it's a sound sculpture, and you push different buttons and it makes these different sounds made all by um, reused objects, really cool looking things. So, um, so people either are, there's enough for them to see that they're gonna take the time to walk over and talk to you. It's very similar to this yoga. I, I realize it's very similar. There's this huge decision that person makes by going through that threshold of, I'm gonna go into that yoga studio. I, I've been walking by it for three years now and now I'm finally gonna go in. Same thing with the art. They, they actually mentally have to give that space away. Like, I have that space to talk to that person about that right now, but I didn't last week. So that's the thing. And as soon as you see that they want to engage with you, that's the moment you you have that moment. You have like 30 seconds to sell them on it. And I hate to say it like a selling thing, but it's either you have 30 seconds to get them engaged, you have 30 seconds to get them uninterested. And so that's the really fun part for me is um, as the sort of artist curator is to really spark their interest so that they really go deeper into what creativity is and what that provides them in their um, daily life. So I don't, I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I might be going off on a tangent, but um, so when you just, so potato chips, I'm, I'm glad that I, I chose potato chips because it's a very happy product. <laughs> and um, and this, is, this truly has, and I'm not just saying this, but this is, I, don't, I can't imagine doing this anywhere else in the world, but right here in the Shenandoah Valley. And a lot of it is, is that as a small business, um, we've gotten so much support from the community and advocacy from people that can make a difference in the community and that can help kind of push us along. Um, we've also, it's, it's also extremely challenging to convert people from one brand of potato chips to another. <laughs> And so I, it, I, sometimes it feels like it's one person at a time. It's like one per, and I don't, um, but, I, but I know that we have a lot of fans here and, um, and it's been a fun community to work in. I, I take yoga at Jill's studio to relax. Carrie and Neil have done some incredible artwork um, for, for bags that we've done. Um, they did, our, they did this beautiful um, sweet potato bag for Costco that was huge. It, it was our hugest rotation ever. And, um, and so these are things that, Matt, these are kind of things that make this community so unique and, and people like it. And we do have a lot of people come by the factory. You can come and watch the cooking. That's always been important. And we can see our customers face to face and have that, you know, it's not exactly the bookshop, but, <laughs> you know, but we have inter a lot of interesting conversations and, and just an endless uh, array of people and humanity that come through there. I have to add to this. Uh, I'm friends with Sarah and uh, I go on road trips a lot to take photographs. And so I do drive down 81 and I try to visit her as much as I can. Because when you do go into the factory and the floor where you know the public can stand and view the uh, cooking, it's really fun to see how how excited people are about potato chips. Uh, but again, it's that moment. It is really that moment of there to get somebody to be really happy about something and inspired moves them forward into different into this place. That's it's just really about being happy in our lives and being human and happy. 
Um, and it's, it's funny you're saying potato chip. I did work at a flower stand uh, when I was about um, 16 or 17, or 18, and uh, realizing at a flower stand, it's all about happy, you know? And what a great job. Because, uh, you know, it, at a flower shop, there might be funerals, but flower stand is happy. It's the spontaneous moment of buying that flower and the flowers. Um, and it's really fun. So the potato chip is the same thing, and visiting her is really great. And I wanted, I did want to, I brought the chips up here because this is part of community building, is that she hires the local artist, you know, Shenandoah Valley, to do the artwork, and she's always done that with all of her chips, no matter, you know, when she was, you know, the other artist that you've hired to do, um, you know, all of them. Um, and that's part of that network of community building. It's really fun, um, and so, So, as far as um, dealing with more or less a client's curiosity, I don't work too much in a retail environment, um, kind of a studio wrap, which is generally a solitary thing, which those of you who are writers, I'm sure many of you work the same way. Um, I find curiosity, like inner curiosity about how things will work is mainly what moves you along and motivates you, but that said, you know, I do work a lot of commission type things, um, both tattooing and fine art or commercial art, packaging stuff. And I get frequently frustrated by the dance between the client and, and what I want to do, but I also feel like that pushes you into areas where you wouldn't be otherwise. Um, and so that, that's where I see a lot of the curiosity from other people. Could we do this? I don't want to do that, but I really want to do that. And then you end up kind of doing something you're surprisingly happy with. Other people can create surprises in your work too. Um, also doing printmaking, um, relief printmaking, letterpress printmaking, which you carve away and then ink and then press. It's the oldest printing technology there is, but people are fascinated by it. Um, people love seeing that something is handmade, um, I love being able to see a press that it's printed on, blocks that are made. Um, so, you know, curiosity about um, the technique of things really captivates people and, and motivates them to buy things like that and appreciate. So I think that all of these stories are fascinating. What you make me think of, Neil, is the steeple that you worked on forever for Chuck and Beth and how he would come in and tell you, oh, we need more of this. You're like, okay, sure. Or I think of the press that's in there in Tin Top that took, I don't know, 10 people to get in the room and is now in the studio so you can see. If you want to go in the back part, he might put you to work, but that's all right. <laughs> but I think that is experiential. So one of the things, I am a retail business, right? I love to sell you whatever you want most of the time, or I will reluctantly sell you other things too. But it's retail, and when I read about on retail in our country right now, what I hear is it's about experience. So part of what uh, marketers are saying, business people are saying, all the official people, is they're trying to figure out how to take retail space and make it experiential. And I think we've shown that that's what we do. So when you come in, it's not, you have to open the space in yourself to be able to receive it, but you're more satisfied when you exit. And I think that effort of experience, we talk about um, Old Town Winchester is a place where we used to joke about doing a list of everything you could buy or do in Old Town, and we thought you never had to leave. Like literally, as long as the Dollar General is still here, we can get everything. Um, but I think that idea, it's a place where people want to be, which feeds retail and business, but also community. So I would like to hear from you all in, uh, when you go out to explore new places, what kind of experience do you find that you are open to, but also um, help inform what you do? Um, so when you walk into, so I'm gonna start with Jill. Do you go in every yoga studio? Because I go in every bookstore. It's really annoying for people who travel with me, but that's the <laughs> idea. So do you go visit and say, how did you do that? We have all mirrors, we have no mirrors, you know that. I would, I would love to be able to do that, but the reality is, is I'm in my studio the majority of the time, so it doesn't afford me the time to really go out and explore other studios. I'd love to, but in the same token, now do I go into physical brick and mortars? 
No, absolutely not, but there's a lot of online presence that I'm grateful for because that allows me to travel without actually physically traveling. So I do, on a digital sense, sure. go and look at other studios and I look around the room as they're teaching, oh, that's a fantastic lighting system they have or whatever. So I do learn, but just not moving out of the studio. Not yet, anyway. Maybe when I'm bigger. When I um, drive around taking photographs in rural areas, I go to uh, um, general stores, like the old, old general stores, and I look at the bulletin boards. I go to the post office and look at bulletin boards. I love post offices. There's a lot of uh, post offices with artwork from the um, WPA era from the 30s. Um, and I like to look at that artwork, but I'm looking for community through bulletin boards. And then the other one is food co-ops. If there's a food co-op, that means there's a really rich community there. Um, and so that's that's how I um, kind of suss out uh, the town, village, or city um, immediately when I'm just driving around. And I usually don't do any research in advance. It's all about this per personal discovery as I'm driving around. Well, I think travel and um, going to play, I was just in New York City and ended up in this little cafe and it was so, it was just an ex awesome experience and it made me realize just how authentic, just kind of those small authentic experiences kind of just help reinforce what we're, do, you know, what we're all doing, actually everybody on the stage is doing, so. Um. I, I guess I probably just look for art. I, you know, it does express the culture, and so when you see stale stuff everywhere, um, you know, you don't have a feel like, oh, I want to look at this place. Um, you know, say Wardensville, there's that place, the Lost River Trading Post, that has a giant red cow with a gun belt on it. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I want to spend some time here. If that wasn't there, though, you might just roll right through it. Um, in old buildings, I know that's probably not the topic, but you, if you feel like if there is a place that has preserved enough of the cool old architecture, things like that, um, oh, maybe this is some place I want to be, but if it just looks like they're level and hide and everything, um, I'd be interested in rolling right through it generally. So. Um, another, well, some other places we like to visit are um, roadside attractions. So recently, we visited a place outside of Winchester called the Farnham Colossi. And this guy just collects um, pretty giant. much anything it, and it, everything. It's There's giant advertising sculptures, so your muffler man, you know, up there, but it, it's, um, you know, He's half got, dozen giant that? ones. It's uh, just 20 minutes, so I'll take a picture. 522 North. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah. Um, He's got a roller coaster in his yard with some like clowns and Simpsons characters on it. Um, it's just it, it's just really creative and fun, and um, we're both really interested in outsider art. And um, so yeah, I found it inspiring, and that's kind of something we've kind of set a goal to do eventually have our own right <laughs> roadside attraction. Uh -huh. uh are you going to have a roller coaster? I don't know. I mean, because I think one, there, one comes our it's, way. Not, a, it's saying, not a working Because if the Zorno Hurston print could be on the roller coaster, I'd be all about that. Uh, I have a friend who's from here but lived, moved to California, and she literally said, I want to retire and do a roadside attraction. She just said that to me, and I was like, I have plans for you. So I'm, I'm sending her ideas continually. Well, and I think that's a fun thing about this valley in particular is because all roads lead here, I laugh. I grew up in D.C., and my family's like, how do you get there? I was like, just go west. Any road you pick will come through Winchester. But I think we are kind of a place. I mean, we have dinosaur land, and we have lots of motels that some are still working. There was even a short film made about the uh, motels and the, all the old uh, hotels along the roads, which I think is interesting. Um, so culture and community is what we build, but it's also what we love. And I think that's um, part of what literature does, writing of all sorts, part of why I like owning a bookstore. Um, but I would ask, in small business, which in our country we define as anyone who has less than 500 employees or something ridiculous like that, we're much smaller than that. There are lots of challenges, some of which technology has helped us uh, overcome, 
some of which has made technology has made more difficult. Um, but uh, I want to ask you all how uh, you work to seasonally sort of confront those challenges. So uh, think about like the calendar. There's eight million holidays for everything. I was just working on August. There's Bad Poetry Day. There's National Book Lovers Day. There's lots of holidays. But sometimes that calendar affects our businesses. Um, and uh, I just would like to hear a little bit about how those challenges of the kind of everyday, how you all kind of find tricks around them as artists and as community leaders. And I'm starting down there. Um, well, I, I guess I'm thinking about the Arlington Art Truck. Because I, once a week the truck goes out between April and November, I am talking to a lot of people, 100, 200, 600 people interact with the truck and the artwork a week. So um, I, I feel like I'm the sort of filter of what the community wants, who they are, what's going on, what are they thinking about. So I respond to that and I create new interactive projects for the next year in sort of an intuitive response to what they're talking about right now. So. Uh, with the artist project, there's a community partner. So this year it was about um, reduction of uh, con consuming, basically uh, reducing waste um, and learning how to recycle better. Um, and next year we're going to talk about climate change um, and flooding, which is uh, just happened in Arlington last week by coincidence. And I have already planning this uh, because the FEMA is going to release a new floodplain map next year. So I, I'm sort of responding to what people want to hear and uh, producing, working with artists and developing projects that will reflect uh, the subject matter they want to talk about. Um, so it's not, you know, responding to that calendar that's a... Uh, no, it's broader. I didn't you know what I mean? But yeah. that, that, that calendar drives me crazy, um, you know, because it's not what people... That's forced. That's a commercial... You know, that's a forced calendar. Um, the calendar, I guess, I work with is what people really do talk to me about, and then how do I respond to what their needs are. Uh, and that, that's different than that calendar. I agree. Well, as a working artist, as well as a business owner, I usually have to, you know, I have to think about, okay, well, you know, fall, like later fall, winter, I'm going to be dealing with, um, you know, holiday sales, so that's gonna take up all my time, so my productivity will go down during that time. Um, and then we also participate in a lot of craft shows and maybe art shows throughout the year, the year. so we're balancing a lot of different things. And um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a juggling act to like try to figure out, okay, when, Okay, when can I start working, you know, on the project? Like we've we've got a show going up in August, and I'm kind of more of a procrastinator last minute, so I'm kind of trying to crank stuff out now, whereas we've all been working on it steadily for months. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. It's constant challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Um, yeah, the way our year seems to be structured. Um, it kind of builds up to the holiday all year. You know, you, you get through the holiday season, get a little bit of mellowness in, in January, February, where you try and figure out something, uh, you know, a direction, I guess. Um, and then just, you know, you, you start getting your commissions, you're doing your art shows, um, uh, craft show kind of stuff, start doing commissions, you just need to make sure you're free to just roll with the punches at the holidays to do whatever needs to get done last minute. Um, so. Yeah, you just gotta kind of stay on top of things, um, work on a bunch of different stuff all at the same time, kind of. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll just have a short comment. So I, I think that the, the main challenge for ma making potato chips day in and day out is is trying not to succumb to factory fatigue. And I do. I have forty five employees, and it's a very intense work and it can be monotonous. And so um, the creative stuff like the flavors and the packaging and you know like when we're running our Mama Zuma's Revenge and these bright red bags and it, it perks everybody. It, it helps kind of alleviate the yeah that what can be kind of intense 
monotony of factory work. And so that's my biggest challenge is day to day trying to figure out ways to alleviate that. One of your, when I was there last time, I asked the woman at the counter what her favorite chip was, and she said, well, my favorite chip is Mama Zuma's Revenge with the plain chip combined. <laughs> I would say, I think, because my business is very different, we don't have a retail, like I said, you don't walk out with anything tangible. Um, my biggest challenge is because I really am the face of my business. I mean, I'm sort of the walking walking piece of artwork that they might hold up, or that tower that you made for, you know, Beth and Chuck. And you can point to that and say, that's my business, that's my work, where I, I really don't have anything. I'm like, hey, this is me, this is Dharma. Um, my biggest challenge is, I'm a mother, uh, I'm a wife, I'm, I'm many, I have many different titles. It's maintaining a sense of peace and calm when I'm upset that, you know, my son didn't do his homework or you know, he didn't come home on time, so I'm late getting into the studio, but my students still expect me to be pleasant, caring, attentive, intimate, you know, all knowing of what they're coming in and seeking. I don't really feel sometimes that I get a reprieve uh, to be human, because as soon as you start to not be your product, it's a very different audience. And so my challenge is trying to maintain that sense of, in yoga we call it santosha, contentment, <coughs> regardless of whatever chaos is behind it. So in one real way I can use that as material because we all have those kind of moments, but who knows, throughout the year there's different, such different stressors and different things that can put me in that position, but that to me is a challenge. I think that's anyone's challenge. I mean, yeah, you have to be yeah. pleasant and you have to, but we're human too, with Absolutely. all the other human issues that happen to everyone else. So that's regardless of a calendar. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, does anyone have any questions they want to ask to the panel, or anyone in particular? Uh, any questions? Yes, Sarah? I would say um, being an introvert is genderless. I mean, I think it, anyone is, you know, uh, I, I actually consider it a gift. I think that I, before I was a yoga teacher, I was a programmer. And so I would just spend hours uh, in a room programming, not really talking to anyone. How you can overcome the discomfort, um, I don't think I'm an extrovert, although I'm paid to be an extrovert in a certain sense, because uh, I talk to people in front of groups of people. It is your passion. And my company's name is Dharma. Dharma means, is a Sanskrit word, means um, what you were born to do. My Dharma is not necessarily to be a yoga teacher, it's meant to build community. So because it's my passion and my Dharma, it overrides that discomfort of talking to a group of people. Uh, constantly having someone you know, come to me and asking questions where in my nature, I would be fine holed up in a room and just reading a couple of books and doing some yoga myself or some programming. It's, if it's your dharma, you will override that discomfort and you grow from it. It's really transformation. It's transformational when you do your dharma. And I happen to believe everyone has their dharma. And you know it because you're willing to put up with that discomfort. I think another way to say it also with dharma is passion. So it's that sort of that light that you have in your, you see it and you, that's what you really want. And so, like I was describing even in the beginning, for me, it's, I think it's really interacting individually with people um, and having just the aha moment of something. Um, and um, I remember once I was at a paint store, this was a long time ago, waiting in line, and somebody said, what are, you, what are you working on or what are you doing? And I said, well, 
you know, I was like, well, I guess I'm an artist. And he said, well, you either are an artist or you aren't. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then from there, so it's this process, you know, it's just, it's like growing up, you know, you, <laughs> you con you're constantly learning and then you just, you keep on falling into the new, new sort of places in your life where you, you know, different positions where then you have a different experience to reflect from and then to reflect back to everybody else. And I think that you just, like you said, that you learn from every day to day your experiences and you get into that place and you're able to just be, you know, support yourself and speak about yourself. Because other people respond to you and you learn from their responses. So, like, this is totally not my comfort zone. I really hate being up here. So, I would say, um, yeah, it's just taking those small steps and, like, networking and finding your people. And um, even though, yeah, the, I, I hate this, I, just, I said yes to it. And I, yeah, I'm just like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it regardless. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think, so an art critic, Jerry Saltz, I was watching a, some documentary and um, he was talking about giving advice to young artists and he said something to effect of, unless you absolutely have to, don't do it. <laughs> and I think that's absolutely true. You, you either find yourself working or you don't find yourself working. And so that's really your answer, whether you're a quote unquote artist or not. And then everyone's going to argue about what art is as well, so there's that. Uh, and whether it's good or not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You either find yourself doing it or you don't. Um, but then again, the, the idea of an audience is super important. I mean, I consider myself a pretty serious painter for, you know, since like 1993 almost, you know. But I didn't show anything or felt like anyone cared until probably like less than 10 years ago, you know. But, um, you know, I haven't done anything but variations on drawing for a living since 1998 either. You know, so there are people that have been supporting me whether I appreciated it or not. Um, but, and, and also at Tin Top, we've given a venue to a lot of different visual artists who had not shown before or not shown much before. And I feel like it was incredible for their self-esteem, you know, just to have an audience, have people out show to see it, you know. Um, writing's a lot more difficult, I'm sure, to get things out there, but um, again, hey, do it or you know, don't. Well, and, and it goes back to what Andy said about, you know, you know, if you build it, they will come. If, like, you know, your paintings are, or your writing is just sitting around your house, no one, you know, no one's going to see right. it. you got to, yeah, make yourself get out there right. and talk to people, so. Uh, I know we have another question. We're actually, our time is up. Actually, Christine, we got, we do a couple. Oh, all right. Question? Uh, my question is actually transposing a few things. Um, and your, uh, Jill, your uh, situation is closer to what I'm going to ask about. Have any of you ever felt like your passion being turned into commerce, did that change your passion? And because I grew up, um, I, I, when I was a young mother, I was a baker, an in-home baker for 10 years. And I grew up baking, so it was a passion of mine. And that ruined it. Like after 10 years of baking so much, I burnt myself out. So do you ever like experience that? And then the other thing I want to say is I'm an, an extreme extrovert. And one day I was punching bread and I realized that dough is never going to talk back to me. And I have to do something else intellectually. So does that ever happen to any of you where you feel like your business or your commerce is interfering with your passion and interfering with who you are? All the time, yeah. It, it, it is. Um... It, it can be. I, this may sound a little dramatic, but it can be soul crushing to, um, I mean, it is and it isn't, but every day you're making decisions and there are things where you want to, you know the things that will help keep you a passionate person and keep the passion and fire burning, but then there are other 
uh, choices that you have to make that are, are less or so, but for the greater good of the company. And so you find yourself compromise, making compromises that you kind of have to for your survival. And that does put a damper on the passion for it. But I, but you just keep, I just keep going and somehow re keep resurrecting. Because as long as I'm doing this, I have to stay somewhat passionate so that I can get out of bed every morning and go and do it. So it's important. Um, for about five years, I booked a club called DC Space in Washington, DC. Um, and mostly music, dinner theater, performance art, storytelling, um, and it was all original. And after four or five years, I was, when we closed, I was so burnt out. I did not listen to music probably for about two years. Um, and I realized that, and I now keep that in my mo in, in mind when I say I love, you know, being having a job as curator. I love art and I love being a curator, but I have to tone it. I have to walk this fine line of making sure that I don't burn myself out. And I realized that with with that experience at DC Space in the '80s, that you've got to walk this line of not burning yourself out if it's something you really love. How do you manage that? And that's with my own personal film photography. I practically don't do any anymore because I'm so tired of working in a dark room, but I will. And I, and I will not, people ask me to take photographs of them, I say no, because I know that it'll burn me out. I'm at this very, so I, you have to manage that. I think the key to this is that I can separate between my passion of learning about yoga, and yoga is not just the physical form, it's the Vedic text, it's a, it's a bunch of stuff. Um, really the yoga poses are like the tiny green of sand in the hourglass that is yoga. I will say I'm a student first. And so I am still, I still have a huge crush on yoga after all these years, you know, and I started right out of college and I'm 47. So after all these years, I'm still a passionate student of yoga. Now, can I get burned out on the business aspect of it, the marketing, the, you know, uh, facility cleanup, all the other stuff that is required to own a business? Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and how do I overcome that? I remember that I'm a student first. And as soon as I stop being a student, I will close the doors because I don't know how to be anything other than passionate about what I'm selling. If I'm not passionate, I'm not, I, I don't know if it's savvy enough to pull off selling something that I no longer have that burning for. So staying a student. I have one other comment, sorry. The other thing is when you do get burnout, it's okay. Like that's the thing, what happened to me, I'm like, you know, this is okay, this is part of life. I got burnt out, we'll just see what happens. And if you just say it's okay and let it go, it is okay. You know? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, usually when that happens to me, I just, I kind of take a step back and I, you know, reassess, like, my business um, and figure out, okay, well, what am I, what am I needing right now? Do I need studio time or um, yoga. do I need yoga? Uh, <laughs> which is always good. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, that way, like, yeah, like, I'm, I don't like being a salesperson at my shop, like, that's not, you know, what I like to do, but, um, so, like, this summer, I've got some college students that are helping me out, so I can have some time away from the shop and, and get re-energized, and, so. Um, so, question, kind of, doing something related to your creative idea, um, for a living, does that burn you out? Um, sure. I guess part of that question too is, does it take away from more creative work? Like if you're doing something strictly for commercial reasons to pay your bills, which is a really good reason to do something. Well, one answer to that is, I don't want to get a real job. You know, period. Like, okay, yeah, I'm frustrated doing this, et cetera, et cetera. But what am I going to do? Work at a warehouse? You know, nothing against people who work at warehouse. And I've met people that work at warehouses that get like two weeks paid vacation and stuff like that. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing? You know, I'm working like 16 hours a day. But, you know, I guess one thing is have something on the side that is a more personal that you're working on too. That may not be your main focus because you got to pay the bills, but you got to, again, that inner curiosity, you got to have some kind of outlet for that. Um, It's true in the book business too. I read constantly. I'm never reading what people think I should be reading. And sometimes I buy books that are so not going to sell because we need to have them. And that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? So it's like, yeah. 
Yes, Andy. So this panel is far superior than the first panel. <laughs> <laughs> You just wanted to be on this panel, too. I'm sorry, you would be too awful with this I really am proud of our community based on the women that are up here right now. Okay, well, I think that wraps it for this. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and I hope you enjoyed the festival.